Hello, Lazio all over the world. Welcome to another episode of Lazio Lounge to res resume, analyze Lazio Dinese in a short sentence. It would be Tati Castellano injury Provedel in the last second of the game. I think that sums up pretty much Lazio Dinese. A total disaster. Something that probably everybody could see it happening, but not like that. Right, Alistair McKenzie? Uh, could we see it happening? I mean, this is, yeah, okay, it continues a run of bad form, but this game was totally different to the ones we've been losing recently. And, you know, there wasn't, there wasn't any excuse for that in the sense that, okay, recently there's been, uh, you know, losing to a vastly superior squad against Bayern. There's been all the refereeing stuff around the defeat to Milan. You know, Fiorentina, Bologna, we played them at a bad time in terms of their form. Florence, so difficult away game, poor away form. You know, all this stuff, there's always been a kind of reason. Same with Atalanta, good form, difficult place. When you're at home to Udinese, and not just that, but when everyone else has already played and you know that three points really pushes you back into contention because everyone else has dropped points above you. I just don't think there is any excuse for a performance like that. I didn't expect that. I thought they would come back after being knocked out from the Champions League with a point to prove. Um, and OK, yeah, there are diff difficult circumstances around the game. We can talk about, you know, the weather and the pitch and the suspensions and stuff like that. But none of that is enough to justify losing to an Udinese side who were on a terrible run of form and are in a relegation battle at home. I thought the first half was decent. We created some chances, right? Zakani hit the post. Chiro Mobile missed another huge opportunity. And we have to talk about how many opportunity Chiro Mobile is missing. Vecino had another chance. Luis Alberto missed another one. I thought the first half Lazio was decent. We created chances. It's even true that Provedel had to make a couple of very good saves. So it wasn't one-sided first half. Udinese created a chance. I found it unacceptable that the second half starts and you concede immediately a goal. You're lucky enough to score straight away. And after, what was it, two minutes, you concede another silly goal to Udinese. I think that's not acceptable. That's like third division Italian football or Scottish league, you know. Hey. <laughs> uh yeah and it's it's another one of these kind of crazy blips in a game that that again underlines this team's inability to put put in a, a 90 minute performance ever really um and yeah you kind of hit the nail on the head there because the first half yeah they did start really well and i thought they came out with real good intensity putting in udinese under pressure uh, creating good chances when Udinese threatened, they managed to hold on. And I thought this looks pretty promising, actually. This is that that was what I was expecting, going back to my point at the start. But the issue, you know, this continuing issue of not being able to take chances is such a big problem that it, it opens up these crazy situations to happen. It's like a, a terrible combination of things for Lazio that they're the worst team to have this problem not finishing chances because then once it gets in their heads, they're going to collapse because the mentality isn't there. Um, and, you know, I read that they had nine shots in the first half without getting any on target. And they're the only team, uh, only the second team all season to have done that in Serie A, the most shots without hitting the target. And okay. Yeah. They did hit the post in that period, but, You've got to be testing the keeper at some point. Shall we talk about Chile Mobile? Because he missed a huge opportunity in the first half. I thought not only he missed that opportunity, after we hit the post with Zaccagni, he made that silly cross that was impossible to reach for Vicino. Should have put it much easier for someone else coming in and finishing it. Um, second half, pretty much invisible. He was subbed 
when Lazio was one goal down. And uh, coming out of pitch, he was complaining, saying, we are 2-1 down, I don't understand. Well, I do understand, to be honest with you. You missed a huge chance yesterday. You missed a huge chance against Bayern Munich. That could have changed the game, we don't know. But, you know, give me lead against Bayern away. Uh, it's a different game. I think Chiro is at four goals in Serie A this season so far. We are beginning of March. This is not enough. Now, we can talk about Castellano not scoring, but I can see why you sub Chido when you need to score, because he's not doing it. He's not, and it's, it's a shame because there was, for a flash of a moment, it, it felt like Chido was kind of back, and he was putting in a, a couple of really good performances and was really becoming one of this, the more positive um stories about what was a quite a difficult period but now yeah three games in a row he struggled and missed some big chances in that time um i think as the pressure ramps up he finds it harder um and look it's probably a sign of that that he came off last night and was complaining about that and saying you know we're two down two on down why are you taking me off you shouldn't if you're the club captain you shouldn't really be challenging publicly challenging a substitution i think that's potentially a, a, a wider cause of concern seeing that happen to be honest um okay sadie wasn't on the touchline last night but it, it shouldn't really matter the thing i'm surprised by vittorio is we've had this problem for so long this season um with tati and with chiro I mean, and I think we've reiterated time and again, it's not, okay, you want your number nines to be leading the way with scoring, but it's not just on them. But at the same time, last season, when Chiro was having his injury problems and we didn't have the number nine, Felipe Anderson was moved in there and did a good job. And we got some of our best results all season with Felipe Anderson playing through the middle. Why is that not being tried again by now? You know, this, this has been happening all season, this issue. And I don't think we've ever seen... To my, I, to my memory, Felipe Anderson being tried through the middle again. I, I think we did it because after the Coppa Italia derby, Tati was injured and Chiro was out. So Felipe Anderson had to play there. And I thought he played one of his best games. So I think, honestly, as you were mentioning, we should try it again. Yeah, because... we beat Juve, beat Roma last season with, with yeah. that system. And I'm not, I'm not saying like that is the answer, but clearly what is happening right now isn't working. So why? And if we know Sarri's not going to change his 4-3-3, he's not going to change his style, although last night they did for a little while, so we can talk about that. But the point is, he's not tactically flexible, So why? but that does change the dynamic of the team. So I don't understand why something that's been tried before and been a success hasn't been looked at again, because this is such an obvious problem with the team. Absolutely. And I think it's, it's the answer. I mean, you said it cannot be the answer. I think it is. Uh, Chiro is not scoring anymore. Cassiano has never scored. With Felipe Anderson, this is a different team. And even Felipe plays better in that position. So, yes, going forward, this should be the solution. And hey, Chiro and Tati, if you want to play, you are the number nine. You should be scoring. So, you shouldn't be complaining. And Chiro scored six goals this year in Serie A. Six. Uh, the second best is Luis Alberto with four. Felipe Anderson is at three goals so far, like Zaccagni and Vecino. And one of the three goals of Zaccagni is the one of yesterday, who, come on, it's not Zaccagni scoring. He, he didn't get that, did he? He did. He did. did he? It's, it's, that is so generous. <laughs> it's, it's never... He wasn't shooting with target. He was putting no. the ball in the box. So, come on. It, Chiro and Tati are definitely struggling, but we have to mention the other players i mean i think uh luis alberto scored last last game but before that i thought last goal was in october against salernitana so it, it, it's embarrassing it's embarrassing and it's not that you're not scoring against inter who has the best uh defense in Serie A. is you're not scoring you're not able to score two goals 
against Udinese, who is terrible, right? Yeah, well, you know, they, I mean, we should say they have this weird record this season, don't they, where they're, they're somehow managing to win big games and they, they beat, um, beat Juventus. What was the other game? They beat Milan, I think it was. Um, and so they're, they're, they do tend to stand up well. It's probably the style of football they have, which is very reactive and, and cautious, can get them results and against teams who are, who are getting a lot more of the ball. But, but yeah, they're, they are definitely one of the weaker teams in this league. And um, when you're at home, and that, that until very recently, until the Bologna game, the home record was a real cause of strength for Lazio this season. And um, not anymore. So, suddenly it doesn't look so much. I mean, it was a horrible night, you know, pouring with rain all day. Um, it's a Monday night, which is never particularly attractive. The pitch looked dreadful um, after the rugby and probably with the weather, because it was the last couple of days, there's been a lot of rain. But even so, I mean, I just think it's um, a, a lot more has to be expected. And a serious team doesn't get, you know, thrown off by these things. No. Uh, what happened to the rugby game? Do you remember who won on Saturday? Uh, just don't pay attention to these things, we uh, Okay. Yeah, yeah. I think it's you made the right decision. Stop <laughs> following rugby. Focus on something else. It's um, been a bad weekend. <laughs> <laughs> it's not finishing. It's continuing. Uh -huh. um, we didn't talk about Lazzari. I I watched it back because at the beginning I thought it was Chiro again. He was 1-1 against the goalkeeper. And again, we're not mentioning Neuer or, I don't know, uh, Buffon. And he missed a huge opportunity. Again, with, when Strikers doesn't score, you could use a little bit of help from someone else. Lazzari wasted a huge chance. And then the ball comes back to Isaacsen, if I'm not wrong. And he hits the goalkeeper on his head with all the goal wide open and you are able to hit the goalkeeper's head i mean even on purpose you wouldn't be <laughs> able to do that right well last he can't find himself in that situation very often it was actually a really nice move that set up that yeah. chance but um but i was thinking as he was coming through i was like how often is last practicing one-on-ones with a goalkeeper and and obviously, a more experienced striker would have taken an extra touch to go around him and, and knock it into the empty net. But this is Manuel Lazzari. He's not a man who's known for scoring a lot of goals. He's not a man who often finds himself in that kind of position. I thought he had a really energetic game, actually. He was one of the better players, I thought, in the first half in terms of the threat he was offering down the right. But there is always that question mark over Lazzari, which is when he gets... He's great at getting into the positions, and then when he gets there, whether it's the crossing or the finishing or whatever, it's it's not always he's not always got the composure. I, I thought he played a great first half, but was dreadful in the second half. I mean, at the end of the game, he had the ball, and I don't know what he was trying to dribble past the the the, the, the attacker, and he lost the ball, and uh, I don't know which Udinese player run one on one against. Our defender that was terrible but i think all year long we'll be complaining about marusic how the hell marusic is always playing uh, isn't it possible that we don't have alternative well we saw yesterday and i think ah a lot of people thought well now i understand why marusic is playing right isai and and Lazzari are not the answer to our problems right yeah. Um, well, I think just the fullbacks generally is a bit of a, <clears throat> an area of weakness, isn't it? I mean, I don't think any of them are terrible players, just none of them are particularly strong players. Um, yeah, and I think this is the issue is that, uh, that kind of we've spoken about this before, but like n no area of the pitch has really been working properly. Um, Defence at times has looked good. Um but really, once you tally things up, especially in comparison to last season, but I don't think last season's a particularly fair comparison because it was a bit of a one-off how good they were 
um, defensively. But regardless of that, I think even in comparison to the rest of the league, it's not been particularly impressive. And there's just such um, such a mental block. And I'm sorry to listeners because we've spoken about this time and again, but there's such a mental block with this team when it comes to going behind. They just can't finish games strongly. I don't know what it is. They can't, they can't react to adversity properly. And it's been happening for so long now, but... That was why after that crazy first five minutes of the second half, I was almost kind of resigned to losing that game because, you know, last year I'm going to manage to respond to that. And it's kind of depressing. I should be able to believe in this team, but I just find myself not thinking it was going to happen. Not only, Alistair. I think Lazzari's chance we talked about before was the last real chance Lazio had in the, in the second half. After that we didn't pretty much create nothing and again it wasn't real madrid it was udinese this is unacceptable and we have to mention we have to talk about the substitution because obviously martuscello sari was uh banned i didn't remember he was squat disqualified for this game but he wasn't on the bench um the the players coming in pedro castellanos Isaacson, Kamada, they pretty much didn't do nothing. I thought after the substitution, last year was even worse than before. That's all, It's been the same for so long, though, isn't it? And, and that's kind of what I mean. I think this is why people are frustrated by the idea that we're constantly trying the same thing over and over again. Like, why, why would that suddenly work? <laughs> I, t I don't understand why, if that's not been working for two months. Well, but those two months have been a disaster. Because Luis Alberto was playing so poorly that you cannot believe that someone can play even worse than that. And how bad was Luis Alberto if Martuscello was convinced to bench him and put Pedro there and play Pedro like a trequartista? <clears throat> Yeah, that was interesting. So, alluded to this earlier. I think I think that almost. I, do, is, do you think this is Marticello's call, or or is this coming down from Sari? No, because Sari, it, Sari, obviously. Yeah, because it is so unlike Sari to do this that that for some reason that that sets off alarm bells in a way more than anything. I mean. It shouldn't because a lot of people have been wanting to see this happen. You know, do something to change the shape of this team to try and, I don't know, make them look a bit more dynamic. But changing to a 4-2-3-1, which is something that has been discussed by fans all season long, pretty much. Um, again, I don't think I can remember that happening any other point this season. No. Pedro's not the the most obvious choice as a as a number 10 but actually i thought he came in and did all right he was full of energy he clearly wanted to make a mark on the game um but it will be really interesting to see if that is actually something that is a plan or if it's something that was just done out of hope in the final minutes of that game just because they'd run out of ideas and that we'll never see it again you know what i was wondering if you play with a trequartista, why don't bring in Andre Anderson? At least it's his position, right? Because <laughs> he's he's probably not run for about two years. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, it's so bad that I, I would have been... I, I, honestly, I didn't understand why Casale was warming up till the end of the game. Yeah. Um... I, I was thinking he would bring it in in the last minutes to, to try and play center forward Maybe, well we you know. got back to, we got back to the point of, of relying on providel to <laughs> to try and score a goal for us so we can get onto the injury in the set just to finish off on the attack the um i mean it's something our friend karsten was messaging me about last night and and he's right you know the uh 33 goals in 28 games in Serie A is pretty poor but to put it this way that is so th we've got 33. Sassuolo are second bottom. They also have 33. Frosinone are 18th. They have 35. You know, <laughs> this isn't um, 
just a poor amount of goals for a team that's trying to get into Europe. This is a poor amount of goals in general within within the league. I mean, it is serious, serious, like, mid-table kind of um, tally. And all the teams above us are in the 40s or more. I mean, it's, it's a big, big problem. That's why I'm just amazed that nothing, so little has been done to try and change things up a bit. Look, last year, Chiro finished with 12 goals in Serie A, I'm talking. Zaccagni with 10, Felipe and Milinkovic with 9. I don't think we are not even getting close to, to these numbers. And this is the issue. I mean, Chiro's not scoring, we understood, but he's still our best scorer. And Zaccagni is down to three only because yesterday they were so kind to give him a, that goal, which obviously... <laughs> It wasn't his goal. So it's, I repeat, the, the game Luis Alberto played yesterday was awful. How many corner kicks did we have? And how many chances did we create from corner kicks? This is simply unacceptable. And we still rely on uh, Luis Alberto. Um, I'm fed up. and. Uh, I want to see Camada starting instead of Luis Alberto at this point. And if Chiro complains about substitution, start scoring next time. Um, I don't know. Maybe we should really... Saturday is Frosinone, who looks like an incredible challenge suddenly. Uh, we're going to have a lot of players missing. I don't know if Guendouzi will be back. Uh, free, free scoring Frosinone with more goals than us. <laughs> I mean... Patrick and Rovella have disappeared. I don't know where they are. Um, I'm yeah. not confident at all. So maybe switch to a... I would have tried a four... I don't know. Three, one, two, rather than a four, two, three, one. But let's try something different. Well, and get rid of the wingers. I mean, are we really missing Zaccagni and Felipe Anderson? No, but if you play a 4 3 1 2 with Lazio, it means you've got Tati and Chiro up front. I mean, uh, Felipe Anderson or Zaccagni could play second striker there. And Luis Alberto, maybe you push him a little bit. I mean, I'm not, I'm not convinced with that because I think this team needs the width and you don't get that width properly from the fullbacks because they're not attacking enough. Yeah, uh, but I mean, if Zaccagni and Felipe are playing like that, I mean, let's try different options. I'm not convinced that yeah. the playing with the uh, Kamada so far back is is the solution. Yeah, and that's why I do think there's something to the four two three one. And but just because I think both uh, Chiro and Tati would benefit from having a player closer to them, you know, as a second striker, a number ten, because it's something Chiro always had under Inzaghi, whether he had, you know, this is what Felipe yeah. Caicedo was so good at. He was a really unselfish player, but he. He was so like big and physical that he always he always took a defender out of the game, and he'd be able to draw in in players and then hold the ball up, lay it off, uh, get the knock-ons, the headers, these kind of things. Which they're not sexy, you know. He's not going to have an amazing YouTube highlights reel from that, but he was a really good foil for Chiro, and he was used to playing with him. And you know, obviously there was you know Tuku Kure and several players who who he benefited from having beside him. I think Tati is like. It is that kind of player, isn't he's he's seems to be a better link up man than a finisher because he is quite good at yeah. doing the kind of Casado stuff I just explained. So I don't know if him having someone around him would then free them up to be the one to score the goals more, but it just feels like whoever is playing as that nine is too isolated. And perhaps if you put Anderson back there, like we spoke about at the start, he's a more kind of free roaming uh, technical player. Quite, a, quite an intelligent player, I think, and good in tight spaces. And I think perhaps if you're going to stick with the 4-3-3, you're better having him there. I mean, I'm no yeah. tactical mastermind, but it just feels like that makes more sense to me than leaving these guys just doing the same thing every week that isn't working. Yeah, I think you have to try a different solution at this point. Or you get sacked, or we try something different. And I agree. Do you, do you think he's close to it? Do you think he's actually at, at risk before the end of the season? 
Lotito doesn't love to do these things, but I mean, we lost the last five, uh, five of the last six games, right? Something like that. And, Seven. Uh, yeah. And uh, we didn't play against huge, te all huge teams. I mean, you lost against Udinese, you lost against Bologna. I would try something. I, I, to be honest with you, I blame the players. Against Frosinone, I would do a massive rotation. I would put Luis Alberto on the bench, Chiro on the bench, or try a different tactic, you know, uh, maybe playing with two strikers with Castellanos and Chiro together and see if that works. Obviously, if you play with Tati and Chiro, you're, you're not going to be able to play with the wingers or you're going to play with 12 men. So you have to pick one of the two. Or you play with a 4 2 3 1. And you could push Kamada as a trequartista. That could be interesting. Or you play with, uh, I don't know, something like a 4 4 2 with Chino and Tati there in front. But something has to change, definitely. Um, I mean, the last the last time this would have happened, I guess, was Stefano Pioli. And that was around this time of year. That was, what, March or April when but, he was sacked and, and Inzaghi was brought in. But that was after one of the worst derby we played ever. The derby is coming up. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. <laughs> and Roma are flying at the moment. So that, that could be the period, the moment, even though there is the Coppa Italia in, the, in between, right? But I it, doubt it, personally. I doubt he would be sacked before the end of the season. I find it quite hard to believe. Well, the season is pretty much over, so it would be useless anyway. But... If it's going to happen, it's going to happen after the derby. If we play badly uh, after the derby, I think he has to be sacked. I, I repeat myself, I don't think it's Sarri's fault. These players are embarrassing, really embarrassing. Um, if you don't find motivation for playing for a club who was fighting for the Champions League, then you probably pick your the wrong job. Uh, you don't need a manager to motivate yourself to beat Udinese at home after a uh, bad defeat against AC Milan, etc. Um, I don't think San is telling to Luis Alberto to waste every corner kick we have or saying to Chiro, hey, miss every single chance as you, you have. I blame the players, but obviously you cannot sell 24, 24 players. It's easier to sack the manager. And I don't agree with the, with the ratings I was reading this morning on the paper. Um, Zakani was the only player who was uh, who was voted as the best player on the pitch. I thought Provedel and Gila were the only players to save yesterday. But you know, if all the players play badly, uh, then the manager gets the blame, right? <clears throat> well, you're clearly not happy. So, can you explain a bit? to the listeners what the feeling is in the stands because there's there was a bit of um talk about that in the papers today you know the the atmosphere kind yeah. of turned. there was a big banner up protesting the club there was whistles at full time so in your experience having gone to every game this season as far as i know how what's how's how's that actually changed you know is it is it definitely got worse now a lot worse now where have people turn against Sari. What are you hearing? What what what's it like in there? Huge difference. I went to every single home game. You didn't. I just leave it there. <laughs> well, you're you also get to be with the fans instead of three kilometers away in the press box. <laughs> well, if you want to join me, well, next year probably. Um this was the first time, the first time, correct me if I'm wrong that we heard the Curva Nord chanting against Sarri. But we have to say that it wasn't all the Curva Nord. It was just a tiny part that was blaming Sarri. And I was in the Distinti Nord. A lot of fans in the Distinti Nord was booing the, the, the Curva Nord chanting against Maurizio Sarri. So I think this is important because we are in a terrible situation dreadful situation and feeling that still the fans are backing Sarri or at least 
75% of the fans, even more, are backing Sari. I think it's it's important. But it's the first time that the Curva Nord attacked the manager. Mm. Interesting. Yeah, I mean, it's, there's always this moment, which is the best way of gauging where everyone's at, which is before the game when they read out the team. And that's when everyone chants the, the person's name back. And the louder the, the the name is shouted, generally the more positive everyone is. And if everyone anyone's got an issue with, with that player, they'll use that moment to kind of boo them or whatever. And I thought before the Milan game, I was kind of surprised how positive Sari's name seemed to be chanted. I mean, not, not surprised because I expected him to be booed, but it seemed to be one of the louder kind of shouts of everyone was, was for Sari. And maybe that was with... The, the win over Bayern still very fresh in the mind and so on. But um, it's interesting to hear that's turning a bit. I thought there were two points we have to make about yesterday. First, booing uh, Luis Alberto when he was subbed. All the stadium boo him. I don't know if it was clear from the TV, but all yeah. the Stadio Olimpico booed Luis Alberto. It's even true that it was... Probably not the right moment to make this substitution. Lazio was playing badly. We were one one down, etc. And uh, Luis Alberto probably took all the complaints. He was dreadful yesterday, a terrible game. But this was the first time ever, I think, Lazio fan booed Luis Alberto. And the second thing is, pretty much all the second half, the Curva Nord was chanting against Claudio Lotito. Who is the number one target? And let's be honest, oh, the exactly. number one. Uh, if it's if there is one to blame, the number one is Claudio Lotito, right? He's yeah, I think, I think that's probably something that everyone's on the same page with by now. For a while, there was a kind of like a little bit more of a divide on that, I guess. But I think most people are kind of on the same page with that. Not always for the same reasons necessarily, but. No one's particularly pleased with him. Um, Alberto's an interesting one. Do you think, is is the booing there just a result of his performance? Is it a greater frustration about his form this season? Is it a perception of his attitude towards games? Because often he looks a bit sulky and like he's not bothering. <clears throat> Clearly, he's a guy who deserves a lot of respect for what he's achieved at the club, but he's always been a slightly spiky character because of all these things he's occasionally done to suggest he wants to leave or to complain or whatever and yeah i don't know it's a strange well, relationship i don't know if you agree with me but with the behavior Luis Alberto had in these years or you play amazingly well or you're gonna be booed and then fans are gonna hate you you cannot blame the owner uh don't show up a friendly games because you want a new contract and then play shitty games like yesterday i mean all your perfect you know chile mobile is the perfect example i would say yesterday he complained and we have to talk about that but he's always been amazing out of the pitch always 100 perfect i would say uh behave correctly and I think that's the reason why when he was sub, he wasn't being booed. But Luis Alberto, you know, you're complaining about everything. You don't show up at games, etc. If you play bad like you're doing this season, you deserve to be booed. Yeah. And, I, well, I, I think the, the frustration is showing with the squad, you know, both him and Chiro and Danilo Cataldi's reaction to the second goal going in. He completely lost his mind. He starts punching the ground over and over again and obviously it's very frustrating you've just conceded a minute ago but you look at that and you're like this guy is not <laughs> keeping it together <laughs> he needs a, i know he's, he... he's passionate he's a last school fan he's going to be upset but as a professional then gotta keep a lid on that a bit and try and get your way back into this can i say something about the two goals because obviously his eye get the blame and i get that but where is zakani there Zakani in the second half of that game decided that he's not going to defend. He's only going to attack. He's not doing uh, the, the, the defensive part, part of the job. 
and we get both goals on his side. And if you go and watch the highlights, like I did, and I was watching it even in real time, I know this, Zakani was close to the Udinese defender without even trying to track back. He said, hey, I'm Zakani. I'm only doing the attacking part. So I think Zakani must be criticized for what he did yesterday. And honestly, I didn't like the first half of Felipe Anderson, but I prefer Felipe Anderson, who at least play for the team and helps the team rather than Zakani playing like that. Yeah, fair enough. Um, I think the final thing we should probably talk about before we finish is Providel as well. Because, oh, my God. Oh, God. It looked bad as well. And the replay, the way his ankle turns. If you're squeamish, don't watch it because it's not very nice. And you could hear him over the TV microphones, you know, groaning in pain. And it doesn't look good, does it? I mean, he had to hop off the pitch for Amandas to come on. That's going to be, I I don't know how long, but he's going to be out for a while, I would have thought, presumably. Um, I was hoping it was a penalty. huge loss. That is a problem. I was hoping it was a penalty. It said it was Tati Castellano. I mean, <laughs> what the hell? Tati, you don't score at least don't injure up our players right oh he knows that he knows that's one of his rivals for the number nine shirt <laughs> yeah probably so if you want to have a laugh about this if mr Gero said this morning is nothing serious while ikorio sports said he's probably uh, tear his ligament so we are talking about 50 days to three months Depending yeah. on which you believe. <laughs> well, hopefully, Mr. Gero is right, but yeah, we'll, we'll we'll have to wait and see. But regardless, I mean, it's um, it's probably Mandas, isn't he? he? Seems to be the number two ahead of Seppi now. But um, and we, you He's know, definitely we, playing on Saturday because we've only it, had one look at him and he impressed people. But he's a bit of an unknown, you know. And Providel has, to be honest. In this terrible run of games, they could have been a lot worse if it wasn't for Provadel. He's made some big saves in that time, and we could say he made a couple of mistakes this season as well. Yeah. Like everyone, he's not yeah. been at the standards he set last season, but still is a massive player for this team. Um, in attack as well as defense. Unfortunately, you're correct. <laughs> well, let's see, Mandas. I mean, I'm not convinced. 100% he's uh, the solution. He's going to play against Frosinone, that's for sure. Now, the question mark is, will Provedel be fit for the Juventus game? We are playing Juventus in Serie A, in Coppa Italia. There's the derby in between. Are we going to play all this game with Mandas? I'm a little bit concerned. What it comes out from Formello is that they are really... Uh, hype for Mandas. They think he's a very good goalkeeper. So it's going to be an, an interesting test for him. Yeah, well, he lives for the Rome Derby. That's what he's all about. So, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, finishing off, I did say in the last podcast what we really needed to do to reset after the Bayern game was get six points from Udinese and Frosinone and see where we are by the international break. That's not happened. Now we're going down the Lazio derby down in Frosinone. Got their second bottom. They've been on a terrible run recently, um, but they're a dangerous side. I think that that um, is, it is an absolute must win. There is no doubt left <laughs> about any of these games. I mean, even for just the hopes of finishing in the top half of the table at the moment. You know, our rivals are looking more like Monza and Torino right now than they are with Roma or Atalanta. So, um, God, really, really have to win that game. Well, now every game is complicated. If you lose at home against Udinese, you can lose ever against... Well, let's not forget we lost against Salernitana. And I don't remember how many no. games... <laughs> 
don't remember Salernitana how many games they won, but I don't think that yeah. many, you know. So. I just, I, I remembered that yesterday as well. I was like, how, like, in the, as the weeks go on, that result gets worse and worse. Like, how has that happened? Yeah, they've won two games all season, Salernitana. And one is obviously against Lazio. The other one's against Verona, who are also, you know, down there. So, uh, well, cheery, cheerful podcast this week, Vittorio. I'm Definitely. sure everyone's going to leave very happy. Yeah, let's hope that when is back. Do you think we missed him that much? That he could have an in better an impact yesterday and change the game? Um, I think I think the team does miss him just because he's he's one of the few who kind of offers so much energy in both phases in attack and defense, and he really and he kind of lifts the the energy of the team. I think just by the way he covers all that ground, and you see his giant hair flowing through the air, and you think, yeah, I'm going to follow that guy. So uh, <laughs> there is there is something there, but um, I again like going back to my very first point. I don't think any of these um any of this context excuses the result i think the team that was picked was still a team that yeah. could and should be udinese at home uh, by the way the the lazio is in retiro till the game to against frosinone that was what lotito decided last night so they're staying at formello till the game and i think afterwards there's the international break so uh I don't think they're gonna keep their keep the retiro. But do you think the retiro is useful? Do you think it's gonna change something? I don't know. I'm never really convinced by the retiro thing. It's like it's just the automatic Italian owner response at a certain point of the season. Like as soon as it's a crisis, it's like right in you go <laughs> into retiro. But I don't know. It's it's used so often that uh, not necessarily with Lazio. I mean, just generally that. I, I find it hard to believe it has a huge, huge impact. I mean, it it depends which way it goes because the the team is clearly unhappy. So if you lock them away together, that's going to make them even less happy, probably. Yeah. So it depends whether the you use the retiro to actually get some solidarity back together with this group and find a way of, you know, lifting spirits, lifting confidence. Or if you're just doing it because it's the thing you do and you've not really thought about that and everyone actually ends up in a worse mood than they were to begin with. So maybe they organize a huge PlayStation uh, competition <laughs> to get them all together. Not if they want to get into the Italy squad this summer. Spalletti is banning the PlayStation. So. <laughs> well, Spalletti is banning Lazio players as well. So I don't think that's the issue. Um, before we wrap it up, Alizer, I want to point out that Lazio Primavera is third in Serie A this year. We, yesterday, while uh, the first one was losing against Udinese, we beat at home Bologna 3-0. So my question is, Diego Gonzalez scoring uh, twice yesterday, I think, yes. Shouldn't be he, shouldn't be called for the first squad, giving an was opportunity? Well, was he was he on the bench last night? Because no. I, I saw that he'd he'd scored in this win, and then I opened my I was looking at the team on my app, and he was listed among the subs. I was like, how can that be? No, he wasn't. He wasn't, he wasn't called for the game. So, right, okay. Well, my app was being an idiot then. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it's hard to say, isn't it? We've talked about this quite a lot in the past of the the jump from Primavera to Serie A, and but the the fact of the matter is you know the team is competing far better than they have in recent years they're in Serie B so recently and uh, it's, it's been a while since there's been a kind of good good news story from the youth sector so potentially um it's worth rewarding some of those players I, I don't watch it as closely as you do so I don't know who who if anyone is really ready for that jump um and when we've talked about this before you've not sounded very convinced no that they are but he's 20 years old he's uh should be playing for the first squad instead of the primavera so and in the lotito's mind he was the replacement for luca romero so you know especially now that are we really playing for something except for pride let's give him a chance 
you know, you can take him off or you can bring him in in the last 15 minutes or so. Rather test him now that we have nothing to lose than, uh, you know, keep the question mark, is he ready or not? Nah, keep him in the Primavera, then send him on loan to Virtus and Tella for a season, and then we forget about him and he ends up at uh, Viterbese or something. That's, yeah. That tends to be the way it goes. Yeah, unfortunately it's true. <laughs> uh, by the way, I'm just checking because you remember last year we were talking about uh, Crispy. Mm -hmm. uh, I think he's at Cosenza and... Uh, I don't think he's done nothing special. So, yeah, he didn't score a single goal so far. Good. Well, he'd fit in very well at Lazio then. <laughs> yeah. Well, he played 170, 174 minutes so far. So, not that yeah, much, to be honest with you. That's fair enough. 25 minutes in the last game. This was the more he played in a single game. And last year, people were saying, hey, why Crispy doesn't start for Lazio? Doesn't he play for Lazio? Well, probably this is the answer, right? He's not able to play with Cosenza. How could he play with the Lazio, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I think it's it's good to see the Primavera actually performing well. But um, yeah. I don't think we're probably quite at that stage yet of having to chuck in random teenagers for no reason other than desperation well give him a try i mean he doesn't have to start i'm, I'm not saying diego gonzalez needs to start against frosinone but maybe come in seeing how the the other guys perform so well alistair we've been talking a lot i think we can uh, close it here uh, before i get too much depressed <laughs> right too late, too you've, late. Ruined, you've ruined my tuesday yeah. <laughs> A lot to ruin my Monday, so I think that's just fair. Yeah. Anyway, even even without uh, even with this defeat, we'll be back after Frosinone Lazio. Maybe talking about another defeat or something's going to change. Who knows, Alistair? Uh, thanks again for all the listeners. Thanks for all the Patreon. We really appreciate your help, especially in this tough moment. It's not easy following Lazio, so we really appreciate your help and your support. And we'll be back Monday after incredible Frosinone Lazio. Take care. Cheers.